There was a piece in uh, Ad Age last week that didn't get a lot of attention that should have, um, where Comscore's measurement of Facebook's mobile audience was exaggerated by 66% in terms of time spent. Um, and all the agency quotes in the store, I can say this, um, all the agency quotes were like, ah, what's the big deal? We don't buy that way anyway. And I was like, good God, they were, they were exaggerating time spent on their platform by 66%. Yeah. Uh, the metrics. And, and it, it didn't no, seem no to one matter is, to anyone. And no one, no one is, no one. I don't think is re can make a reasonable argument that that there aren't, you know, really dramatic shifts occurring. Let's just accept that as a yeah. given, right? Um, you can argue about the, you know, the kind of rate of it or whatever, but it's happening. No one's in denial, right? The, the fact of the matter, however, is that traditional forms of viewership still significantly outpace. There, now, yes, the consumption's happening in different ways, and yes, to your point of addressable, which I'm not sure we've really answered uh, fully, um, there are lots of ways that still yet have yet to be developed to do a better job of that, but this, this, I think the discussion should really be more about how, how traditional content is being viewed in, 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 in new ways and, and how to best and most accurately measure that so that you can properly monetize it because there's so much more economic opportunity for everybody in the value chain in doing that than continuing to chase the corners of the, of the conversation, which is a lot of what is you know, still happening. Yes, sir. Yeah. I'd, char I'd characterize it slightly differently because I, I, the comment you guys make that Google and Facebook absorb most of the mind share, I, th I think that's right, and then we proceeded to mostly talk about Google and Facebook. Um, and you know what's, I think it's it's uh, sort of a combination of what's happening on linear TV and the downward pressure on linear TV packages. Right, you've got 300 network packages that are shrinking, and they're shrinking in a variety of ways. You see what Sling TV did, right, where they now have network packages of 20 to 30 networks. You see what the distributors are now doing, where they're saying, look, I don't want to pay for all of these networks. That a lot of these networks people don't watch, so why am I paying for them? The underlying business model of linear television is obviously very good for programmers because on a subscription side, most of those networks, you accrue revenue for it whether anyone watches or not on the subscription side. So there's downward pressure that's hap happening there. Then you have other sets of direct-to-consumer services, Hulu, uh, Netflix, and others, which are at much lower price points but are still aggregations of lots of content. And so you can get these things for seven, eight, nine, ten dollars and they create downward pressure, in particular on the advertising business because they either have vastly reduced ad loads or they have no ads at all. And so you have this pressure on the, on the big bundle where the, the distribution is getting a little bit smaller and then you have pressures online as you move to OTT services where consumers are actively making certain choices not to watch advertising. That then pushes you into a whole new set of ways to try and sell advertising and aggregate an audience, right? And so do you push yourselves more into something like what CNN.com does or, you know, or ESPN.com does or other services like that where, the, where it's largely clip-based content and you're driving revenue from that? Or are you gonna push yourselves more into direct-to-consumer services for individual networks that may have gotten dropped out of that big bundle and you're starting to see things like that now, and you're seeing hybrid models like CBS All Access and other, and other services that take some from linear and some from digital. And so the equation for like what types of products consumers are actually seeing ranges from 300 network bundles into individual networks that are direct to consumer into SVOD services that have no ads to purely ad supported sites like CNN.com. And so you're trying to figure out how to wrap an advertising model all the way around that. That gravitates people to things like audience-based selling because there's this, you can find that audience that cuts across all of those different things, and hence the rush to data. Well, the total, what's the, it's also the total audience piece though, right? But in, yeah. in the dynamic that you just set up, Jeremy, typically people, you know, to generalize, typically there, there are people who are either drawn to that chaos or there are people who can't run fast enough away from that chaos, yeah, right? right? Yeah. And my, my, my perspective <coughs> is everything that you just described I think it is so awesome. And I think what should be happening is people should be rushing to that because it's only by going through that process, call it the awkward teenage years, right? It's only by going through that process that you actually get to the place on the other side where you realize what's really of value. So yes, there are gonna be networks that are gonna continue to get paid for handsomely. 
Yes, they're going to get networks that are going to get thinned down. Yes, there are going to be networks that are going to get dropped altogether. And yes, there are some networks that, where people may agree to carry them, but not pay for them, right? And, and therein lies the ability for consumers to make choices. Last time I checked, choice wins, right? So if you lean into that and you allow for people to reconfigure, interestingly, there's a percentage of the population, as evidenced by like, I don't know, 60 years of media, which once you've bought like four or five bundles, packaged thin packages, you realize, oh crap, I'm economically I'm actually better off just buying the total bundle, right? But people need to go through that process and figure out what matters to them. If only sports matters to them, well, then they may end up being a different type of consumer. But isn't it great that they're a consumer? I think, I think one of the big things is the education piece on the other side, right? This is, okay, buy TV, pretty straightforward, right? A lot of nuance to it, but buy TV. By digital, all of a sudden, okay, well, how about mobile? Let's get into tablet. And by the way, you can do some live stream, or you can do some VOD, and all of a sudden, it starts sprinkling a little bit. And I think that, frankly, publishers, to a large degree, but certainly the advertising agencies out there, they don't want to do that. Mm -hmm. They want a one-stop shop. So I completely agree with Kevin. I think that everyone should embrace that. That's where it's going. If I can you know, get everybody here to spend a dollar versus, oh, I'm going to get $2 over here, but I'm going to miss this segment. I'm gonna, like. It's, it's a losing proposition. Right. So it is, it's hard to say you want to be all things to all people, but that is the choice that the, the general public has in terms of consumption. And if we are looking at this the right way, ultimately, yes, we all want to make money, get that, and we want to publish our stuff, get that. But the idea of pleasing the end user is sort of number one. Close number two is can we give the power to the brands that do business with us the ability to make money? And, right? having, and having personally lived through the music industry, right? Because that's where I was between 95 yeah. and 2000. I will tell you the biggest learning from all of that was that the laws of gravity chose to try and resist what consumers ultimately wanted, right? Put the economics aside. The, the, the equivalent is the full album is the equivalent of the full bundle. Yep. And, and consumers voted and said for percentage, for percentage, like, I don't want the full album, right? And four years of debate over whether should it be the full album, shouldn't it be the full, for, full album, is what created an ultimate dynamic, which ironically, more music ended up being consumed by more people in more places around the world than ever as a result of the digital dis disruption. And having actually personally settled the first lawsuit with mp3.com and been deposed in Napster five times, right? I'm telling you, the mistakes of that error we're not leaning into it, not allowing for it, and then embracing a different way of monetizi monetizing that consumption, that is a winning formula. So if everybody in the room, everybody in this conversation, everybody in the value chain could simply embrace, like, lean into it. Because if you have more people consuming more media in more ways, and then companies like Operative and others can help to smooth out how you go about aggregating the ability to deliver those audiences across a variety of different platforms and devices, that is a very bright future. And that's one that I think we should all be really looking forward to. It's an incredibly important point. So it's an incredibly important point. That's a lot of what we talked about last week at our annual event is how we continue to push, you know, particularly intermediaries and, and service providers to, to help create more value for the consumer because that ends up as a much better world rather than fighting it. Um, at data, I just, I don't want to not, talk about data a little bit here, because I, I at least personally think it's um, one of the most important discussions in the next couple of years. Um, and the distinction between first party, third party data, who owns the data, the consumer's relationship to that data. Um, how are you thinking about data in your world and, and that distinction between the value that's probably floating from third party data up to first party data? Uh, I, on the Turner side, I mean, we're doing a lot of things that a lot of folks are doing. I mean, we're, we're focusing heavily on our DMP and building that out and aggregating third-party data sources as well as first-party data sources. Um, and, you know, there, we have the same industry issues that other people do, which is, you know, there isn't really a common currency. Uh, I used a term yesterday as I, I think the industry essentially needs a version of TV everywhere for data. Um, if everybody's going to be able to get on the same page or on some sort of common currency and measurement, um, you're going to need an industry-wide effort to actually do that because each individual media company, each individual agency is pursuing slightly different paths about you know, how they're measuring and how they're tracking underlying data. 
from a Turner perspective, one of the things that we're particularly focused on, um, at least you know, it, it conveniently ignoring the broader industry issue, are you know, creating deterministic links between linear and digital. So essentially what's, what's happening right now is, is everyone is prognosticating about the audience that's on television and is that the same person on digital. That is an area in which uh, Google and Facebook really can't compete because they're not on television. They don't know who's, who's watching. We actually do know who's watching as an industry. And so you can begin to do things like understand how many exposures a promo has on television, how many exposures a promo has on digital, and then knowing whether they watched. Like that data set is actually in existence, you know, even within this room. And if we're able to capture that, I just really believe that's going to harness the value proposition of television and digital advertising. The digital folks, we have the same problems within our company, I think a lot of other folks do, is, is the digital ad folks, you know, were in a different building from the linear ad folks, and then they moved into the same building, and now they're actually sitting on the same floor. Um, and so as that integration, I think, begins to continue and the selling proposition back to advertisers and agencies is more cross-platform, we have a unique opportunity to create a value proposition that I think traditional digital competitors um, can't provide. Let's, let's each address this one. Um, I think that, I, mean, I think I, I would agree with a lot of what you're saying. You know, for us, our focus the past year definitely has been getting our own DMP, which actually is not just an ABC project, that's a cross media networks within Disney project. So, you know, we're working, ESPN is on the same DMP, um, Freeform is our own stations, we're all on one together. Um, and we've been having a lot of conversations about bringing data-driven sales to digital inventory. Right now, really, that's been the focus. I think we're thinking about data as it relates to linear inventory today, more about targeted schedules, optimizing within our programs to deliver a strategic target versus just a straight demo target, you know, if, if that makes sense for an advertiser. So we're, we're looking at work like that. One thing that's been surprising to me, though, in the digital side of the conversation is everyone's in a rush to have the conversation with you. Not everybody has their act together on the buy side. And that, to me, has been really interesting and that's educational. Really good point. <laughs> um, everybody's dying to talk about it, but how much are we actually doing? A lot less. And part of it comes from the fact that, you know, you know ABC is not a registered site to the, uh, or, or service. To the extent you're authenticating today, that data is sitting with the MVPD. And we have not yet come to the business and other terms that we would need to to, you know, be bringing that data back to us. So to an extent, today, the most actionable data sets against our inventory would be a third-party data set or a segment that made sense for the advertiser or the advertiser bringing their first-party data. It's interesting how much is getting lost in the plumbing of actually trying to bring that segment in, as well as how few of our advertisers are actually sure of how, what they want to bring to us. So I think it is a huge source of value for the future. We're spending a lot of time building our own capabilities, making sure as much of our inventory as possible is addressable, specifically inventory that's currently on platforms where we're not getting you know, a scalable device ID passed to us, um, like over the top or places where you know, maybe we're distributing through a third party and making sure that we have an agreement in place and a mechanism to pass that to us. So we're, we're laying the track, I guess, but I, I still think it's very early, very early. but I, I do agree there's a lot of value there for us. So I've organized um, our company around, uh, so I have a thesis, and the thesis will either be proven right or wrong or be modified in some fashion. Um, and the thesis is that every company in every industry should have its own unique identifier. And that that unique identifier should represent all of the characteristics um, that it knows about its respective audiences, plural. And uh, for one company, that might be, in, in one industry, that may be 45 characteristics. For another company, another industry, it may be 30. So uh, it's a framework, it's an architecture, it's a blueprint. Um, you know, it's, it's, not, it's not rigid. Uh, that unique identifier is made up of three components. The first layer is the common data that frankly everyone has you know, available um, and should have available as a base layer of information about who that individual is. The second layer um, is a set of characteristics that are unique to the relationship that you as a company, you as a brand, you as a product have with that individual. Um, or household, 
And the third is a deep layer of enrichment that happens around the uniqueness of your value proposition, the uniqueness of your relationship, and how deep can you go you know, with that individual or with that household. And that the combination of those three layers, and you can make it more complicated, you could argue it's three, four, five, but the combination of those layers of data in total represent what I call your unique identifier. That unique identifier for us is the equivalent of the Coke formula, okay? It goes in a vault. There are very few people who even know where the vault is, never mind have access to it. And under no circumstances do you ever allow for the total sum of that unique identifier to go to any other party other than yourself. So the total unique identifier is only used for the purposes of creating value for your company. You can decide and determine which subsets of data you make available to third parties under, under and on what basis. Wait, so um, I'm sorry. I'm, oh. Let me finish. Right. So you can, so you can, you can take. <laughs> I'm the idea. I just have a you can take subsets of the data um, that you can make available in a direct selling relationship with an advertiser or with a third party business partner or what have you. But nobody other than you gets to ever use the full unique identifier. The reason for that is that the only way over time to sustain premium is if you have arbitrage value. In the absence of arbitrage value, you will never sustain premium. And, and so in a world where everybody thinks that you know, Facebook's going to eat the world, Google's going to eat the world, because they have access to all the data they'll ever have, I, I fundamentally reject that. And I think that every company, and I don't care whether you're pharmaceutical, automobile, media, it doesn't matter, every company has the potential to create this unique identifier. And by aspiring to know this much about your audience, and have that data, it then allows you to have access to the thing that I actually think is more important, because the conversation is all about data. The thing that's actionable is insights. So only when you have the full set of attributes are you then able to put real effort around creating and deriving insights, which will ultimately create value where it matters and be able to monetize at rates that are far higher than the rest of the marketplace. Wait. That's my thesis. Love it. So Google has tags on nearly 90% of the pages on the web um, that matter, the premium publisher pages. Uh, Facebook like buttons, you guys have littered all of your sites that collect data um, for Facebook. Verizon sees all traffic over Fios, and what, which, which of those three things are a problem in that world? What, what do they not have access to those, in your those unique thi identifier? Those things, don't those things don't concern me at all, because in, in the relationship that we have with an individual and a household, so there's basic individual household data. Then there's unique stuff that only we know about, you know, which individual is what, you know, we, we you know, we'll do 900 football, meaning soccer matches. You know, there's nobody other than us knows, you know, how many and which ones of those 900 matches are being watched and by whom in the house. Then, then you layer on top of that entertainment programming, other kinds of programming, news programming, but even then more importantly, you know, I have two million people signed up paying every month for a discount pharmacy program called Pharmacia, which delivers 25% cash savings on the purchase of medicines for someone in the household. I have three million people carrying a prepaid card. I have a million and a half people using a mobile plan. So, so I, I, I would challenge all of the traditional folks, Facebook, Google, anybody you want to name, I dare you to try and figure out everything that I know about what's going on in that household in terms of what are they viewing, what do they like, how much, and, and who's carrying the prepaid card, who's using the mobile plan, who's a member of the Famasia discount pharmacy program, et cetera, et cetera. Good luck to you. Got it, got it, okay. You can, you can uh, uh, questions? Just, uh, yep, done. just to be cognizant of time, and, and we want to keep the panel up here. Uh, just to take some questions and maybe yep. comments from the audience. Perfect. Questions hey, or Lauren, comments. Lauren, Lauren, can I do one? Yeah, yeah please, just go ahead. Literally yeah. 30 seconds. Just one, on top, just 30 seconds. On top of all this stuff, yeah. it's great to know what you're doing in your own house. ESPN has the luxury of tens of millions of registered users and we got a ton of data. Doesn't mean bubkiss unless we can tell somebody out there why it matters to them. That's great, I know everything about my guys, which is awesome. But unless I can apply it to whoever's buying, 
it becomes less relevant. And I mm -hmm. think right now there's a gap. I think people are assuming, okay, great. But I think very, very soon people are going to be like, well, wait, what does that mean for me? That's it. That was 30. That might have been last. I think that was right on 30, actually. That was 30 seconds. All right, where are the microphones? Can we get a microphone <laughs> over here? Um, so I know we didn't really talk about the concept of price point right now, so I kind of wanted to get a general census from the panel. We're talking about the yield curve, um, but we're seeing really disparate pricing in between our lineal models and our digital models, where linear has um, come down a little bit in rate, whereas premium digital video can sometimes sit anywhere between 40 and $50 if you're looking at specific long form full episode player. How do you close that gap in a way that you get the largest yield demand um, in the sense of how do you drive linear up in price a little bit, um, drive digital down in price a little bit to unify that rate um, without compromising the growth trend in a digital, a double digit growth in digital? Um. Yeah, if I knew the answer to that yeah, one, I'd hey. be retired. Uh, <laughs> you have to buy. You have to buy. Yeah. You have to buy both, and you, you and you you allocate the appropriate premium to both, and then you do a blended CPM. Why does that not work? You have two separate budgets that you're running. You're running a linear budget, you're running a digital budget. Yes, they fall under the same OCF, great. Um, but you, I see cross-channel conflicts sometimes within the sales teams. You know, They're responsible for their particular budgets. They're trying to meet the demand of their particular budgets and meet their goals. Um, but you really have to compromise, right? Because someone is going to be on the losing battle of that blended CPM. And how do you work within your orgs to help to stabilize that type of cross-channel conflict? Okay, I think that's, that's a slightly different that, question. That's a structural issue. Because I think, yeah, I think that I think I think I, I think you hope that everyone heard that the the big, huge, huge, strong theme here today is about being externally focused on delivering for consumers and delivering for marketers, right? And the internal complexities, challenges, organizational obstacles that we have, that's all bullshit, right? So that, that honestly, I mean, if, if, if at the end of the day, if this is about building a robust digital economy that really serves marketers and, and consumers, then, then internally you have to be prepared to blow up what you have, be entrepreneurial, and create you know, a common set of goals and metrics for sales organizations, blend those sales organizations, and ultimately provide equal incentive, which is the, the approach we took. You can't, you can't have one group more incentivized than the other, because you'll never serve the marketplace. So you might as well get out of the business, because you're gonna fail. And I, I, Lauren did a good job, and the, the video that Kurt and everything that went on weather, that speaks to exactly this. And I think on the other side of the coin, too, and I know I keep trying to be advocate for uh, you know, the, the agency side and the client side, the education piece there is we've got to, we got to demonstrate the value proposition of doing it as one, right? And it is. It is valuable to say it doesn't matter where my user is, on air, online, whatever. We're going to deliver the right message in the right environment behind or in front of the right piece of content. And I think that's where... That's where we win. So it's, yeah. it's a continued education. I would too. love to have that conversation with your management team. He's right over there. <laughs> <laughs> okay. That's, that's the equivalent of Len Riggio 15 years ago with a company called Barnes & Noble <laughs> setting up different incentives for brick and mortar yeah, versus give, give digital and, Mike. and somehow that thinking, that, yeah, and somehow to, thinking go, that Barnes & Noble was going to be successful. <laughs> that's just, that's just you're, foolish. You're <laughs> Mike just had a kid six weeks ago, so we'll, we'll let him off the hook. And he's got a beignet in his mouth. All right. <laughs> um, so when you are looking at your yield curve and increasing your margins, I'm curious, where are you guys seeing your biggest operational inefficiencies, and what are you trying to do to bring those down? Only non-operative customers answer that. <laughs> I, I think within, within the world of Turner, it's, it's uh, inventory management. I mean, it, it just, it's, it just, you know, you're, you're launching all kinds of different ad products. You're basing them on Nielsen. You're basing them on audience segments. You're basing them on third-party data. And the transactional systems that come from linear as well as digital just aren't set up today to handle that. On linear in particular, uh, it's an issue because everything is built off of Nielsen. 
And so anything that you want to try and do and scale, obviously, you're basically doing on a spreadsheet initially, and then you're trying to figure out how to actually dynamically insert that you know, into, your, into your inventory management system so that you can have more real-time stuff. But I also think that, that you know, what gets lost in this a little bit is just the fundamental difference between um, supply and demand within television video versus online video. I mean, in online video, you can create more video. There's a reason people turn on autoplay, right? <laughs> Say, hey, we're running short on video. Let's just flip on autoplay and streams go up. Like right? crack, though. Hard it's, to get it's, off. it's crack, right? I mean, Facebook is perfecting it, right? I mean, you go through your news feed, every freaking video starts and you can't hear it, right? On the linear side, inventory is scarce, right? And so you're, you can't just invent more of it with, without just simply cramming more ads in a pod, which causes viewership to go down. And then you get in this vicious cycle that, that the industry is in today. And so you can look at some of these trends, right? The, the obvious thing on broadcast is broadcast ratings over time have been, you know, have been going down over time for a really long time, but their ad businesses have actually stayed pretty robust. And the reason is, is that even that the audience are still big enough so that you can have CPMs that are high enough and they continue to grow. As audiences decrease, it actually creates more scarcity and the price has been going up. That doesn't really happen in online video. So it, it, they're, they're still fundamentally a bit different. And until some of the technologies come into play that change the nature of how linear advertising can be sold, and then you know, programmers determine how that's going to be sold, I don't think you'll see a full normalization. You're going to have these hybrid models that exist over time. I, I would just add maybe probably everybody's least favorite thing, which is late creative. It is, we all sell something perishable, and there's really no stick with which to chase the advertiser that's truly effective and won't potentially damage your relationship long term. But you know, that, that is a pain point, I think, for, for most everyone. Uh, the other thing I would say is that a lot of, even, even what Jeremy here was sharing, I think a lot of it comes down to just packaging. Um, you know, maybe this is a little bit, you know, sort of elementary, but, you know, over the last two years, we've done a lot of work inside of, you know, my group looking at the way that we were packaging our inventory, working with our content teams about the way they were tagging things because essentially we needed to create more fluid supply. We needed to be able to sell deals that could flow like water and then deliver them like water wherever the inventory was. Particularly when you're dealing with sort of like a news site or something, it's a little bit less predictable. You don't know exactly where everybody's just gonna show up, which section, is it gonna be a big entertainment story this week or is it gonna be a big political story? Um, I think that the fundamentals of packaging and actually spending the time to rethink about the way we were actually putting those packages together how we were selling them in the marketplace and then how we were setting things up in the system to run. We cut our revenue at risk, which is sort of our weekly kind of, I don't know, gauge of how we're doing tremendously just by taking the time to do that. But it took ops, planning, content teams, and sales all to coming together. I, I think these guys have totally nailed it. I mean, we've, we've, so the only thing I would say is for us, it's internally, it's about the, the issue is the tech stack. <laughs> Externally, we've talked about programming dynamics, great points about you know, Facebook, Google, they can do crazy things with pricing, it doesn't affect their inventory, blah, blah, blah. For us, it's, it, for us, it's tech stack. It makes it really hard. The combination of you know, the rigmarole that everybody has to go through, I think, makes it really hard to provide the level of service that I think we would all like to be able to provide to our, uh, our customers and our clients, which is why, full circle, I think there's just such an enormous opportunity to smooth that out in internally. Any other comments or questions? Any other business model or strategy? Any blockers to anyone's business that's preventing them from moving forward that we haven't talked about yet? And I know not everyone in the room is a TV company, by the way. All right, All right. we got one question over here. <coughs> Comment, question, either way. Make this the last one. I've heard a lot about- What's your name, sir, and uh, what company are you from? I'm, I'm Joe. <laughs> I've heard a lot about uh, DMP and data and audience segmentation today, which is, which is good, by the way. I, I'm just curious. At the end of the day, it's all about convincing a customer to buy the product. How do you create engagement for the DMP and the data that you collect? Because I haven't heard anybody talk about it, like, boy, that, that ad really moved me and I'm actually the right person, but you just yeah. target it. How, how do you, you, how do you convince did, me did, to? Did you use the word engagement? Yes. Yeah. Um, 
so I, I would just say, yeah, I, I, think you, I think you make a great point. I think, we, I, think I would say remiss, certainly on my part, in not um, really emphasizing that at the end of the day, I, I actually think when we look back 10 years from now, the metric that is going to matter the most is engagement. Um, and that uh, I, I'm actually optimistic. I spend an enormous amount of time with Nielsen. I'm recently spending an enormous amount of time with Serge Mata as he brings Comscore and, and uh, Rentrack together. Um, and and I, I'm, I'm careful, cautiously optimistic that we're on a path where engagement, you know, other metrics aren't going to disappear, but engagement metrics are going to come to the surface and I think be kind of cut through the BS and, and, I, and I think help us to better distinguish between where the value is really being delivered because today I think for all the reasons we've talked about, there's just way too much attention based on sort of, you know, mathematical delivery without really understanding at the end of the day what's happening with the consumer, what do they really care about, what are they engaged in, and what actions are they taking as a result of that? I, I think on the, the programmers have to be more flexible on ad formats within ad pods. So if you're talking about engagement with the advertising itself, right, I mean, we're, <coughs> we're largely torturing people. I mean, we've got, you know, hour-long shows with 18 minutes of commercials and average three to four minute ad pods that generally come in at inopportune times in the content. And so not only do you hit them once, you hit them you know, eight ads within the course of an ad pod. And so one of the things that we were experimenting with, we made this announcement and what we're trying to do with True TV is to actually collapse the linear ad pods to make them much shorter and have one advertiser actually tell a story. And we try and actually, we're experimenting to try and actually make that ad contextually relevant to what the content itself is so that the consumer is engaged with that advertising all the way through the pod. And so we're now beginning to actually track what the consumption patterns are from the content to the ad and then back to the content and to see how much drop off there is in terms of the engagement of the consumer in that model versus the traditional model. The, the early results are encouraging, but we certainly aren't doing it at scale yet. But if it proves out to be a model, we'll certain. If it proves out to be a model that works, we'll certainly do it. But then it becomes incumbent upon the advertisers and the agencies to change the way that they create creative, and how they buy. And that's a very different type of buy. It's a very different type of price, and it's a very different type of ad creative than the, what they've traditionally done with 15s and 30s. All right. Well, let's give these guys a round of applause. Great panel. Sure.